Good morning, River Church. Welcome. We're very glad to have you here today. My name is Andre. I'm one of the elders here. We've been going through the book of Ephesians, and we're going to continue that today with Ephesians chapter 3. But before we get to that book, I want to talk about another book. It's, it's one that I hope that you are familiar with, one that I hope that you've read. It's called The Sneetches by Dr. Seuss. And I think it's, it's a timeless book. And if you haven't read it, I encourage you to go home after church today and read it. It'd take you like three minutes. But it has a really good message. If you haven't read it, the Sneetches are, are yellow creatures, and they live together on this beach. And one group of the Sneetches has stars on their bellies, and the other group doesn't. And the star belly Sneetches consider themselves superior based just on having that star on their belly. And so when they would get together, they would never invite the plain belly Sneetches to join into their games and their hot dog roasts and everything like that. The plain belly Sneetches were considered inferior and excluded. Then one day, a guy rolls into town named Sylvester McMonkey McBean, and he has this machine that will put stars on the plain belly Sneetches, and it will only cost $3. So the plain belly sneeches all line up to pay money and go through McBean's machine and they come out with stars on their bellies. And then they go out and they try to mingle with the star belly sneeches. But the sneeches that always had stars on their bellies are indignant. How can it be that these plain belly sneeches now have stars on their bellies and think that they're now the same as us? This is like blasphemy to them. So McBean brings out another machine, one that can remove stars. And the Sneetches that always had stars on the bellies line up and they pay McBean money to go through the machine to have their star taken off. And this time, it'll only cost $10. And what happens is that this goes back and forth for a long time, with the Sneetches paying money to either have a star put on or taken off, trying to fit in. And eventually, it gets to the point where the Sneetches can't even remember who had a star and who didn't? And they come to the conclusion that the stars were never really that important to begin with, and they all become friends. And then McDean drives off with a wagon full of cash. <laughs> the Sneetches is a story of prejudice and discrimination, and it's, one, it's about one group that feels superior to another and then acting on it. The Sneetches are fictional characters, but some people still act like star belly Sneetches today. You may experience it in your school or in your community. Years ago, when I was younger, I spent three months living in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania as part of a discipleship training program. We were studying the Bible, and I was preparing to, to spend four months in Peru with a, a group of other college-aged people. And the place where the, the discipleship center, the training center, was was close to a, like a park with a basketball court. And the locals used to go play soccer at the, the basketball court. And one day there was a group of people there playing soccer and I desperately wanted in on the game. So I, I put on my shorts and a t-shirt and I ran over there and I wanted to see if they wanted an extra player. And it turns out that they didn't. And I remember that no matter how I phrased my request, the answer from the guy with the ball was still no. So I made the slow walk back to the Cyber Center, feeling very much like a plain belly Sneetch. And this sort of thing happened in the Bible, too. I want to take a, a brief look back in time just to see how the people in the time of this letter, the letter to the Ephesians, arrived at their current situation. I think it'll give us a better understanding of some of the reason why Paul wrote the letter to the Ephesians. Looking back in the Bible, the Jews were kind of like the star-bellied Sneetches. God had made a covenant with them in the Old Testament, and they became God's quote-unquote chosen people. They were the favored ones. And not just that, but God gave them a set of laws and told them to consider themselves, to keep themselves clean and to avoid people or things that were unclean. They considered the Gentiles, the other group, main group of people, unclean, and so they had limited interaction with them. The Gentiles were like the plain-bellied Sneetches. They were excluded from Jewish culture and religion. They were considered heathens. 
And this is how things went on for a very long time in the Old Testament. But later then, things slowly start to change. The coming of a Messiah or Savior is foretold later in the Old Testament. And God also says that he will eventually use the Jews to save the Gentiles and the rest of the world. This is what you read in Isaiah chapter 49 verse 6. God says, I will, make you, I will also make you a light for the Gentiles, that my salvation may reach the ends of the earth. This is coming at the end of the Old Testament, before Jesus came. And the Jews would have been familiar with these passages in the Old Testament, but many did not understand when these things would take place or how. They were just kind of put out there, and they were just kind of waiting for all this to happen. When Jesus does finally arrive, and he starts his ministry, the newness of everything he is doing and saying takes people by surprise. Jesus is teaching, he's, pre he's preaching a new message of forgiveness and grace. He's handing out stars to everyone to put on their bellies, well, figuratively. The Jews had been following God's Old Testament law for almost forever. Now instead of following this complex, complex set of laws that God had given them, where forgiveness and salvation came from animal sacrifices, and obeying rules, Jesus now shows up and he's just offering forgiveness through grace without having to do all these, these things. This is a new covenant that God makes with the Gentiles too, not just the Jews. The Jews all of a sudden are no longer solely God's chosen people. Now salvation is for Gentiles too. Jesus, Jesus is removing the categories of clean and unclean. The Gentiles are now also the children of God. I didn't come up here to talk just about sneeches and, and stuff. We've been talking about Ephesians, and I want to just rewind a little bit and talk a little bit about the first two chapters that Randy's been, been covering. I'll do this briefly. In Ephesians chapter 1 is where Paul says that God chose to adopt us, both Jews and Gentiles, into his own family through Jesus. It's at this point that Paul teases what he calls a quote-unquote mystery. In Ephesians 1, verse 9, it says, God has now revealed to us his mysterious will regarding Christ, which is to fill his own good plan. And this is the plan. At the right time, he will bring everything together under the authority of Christ, everything in heaven and on earth. And then in Ephesians 2, Paul talks about oneness and peace in Christ. Some of the verses that, that we read in, in Ephesians 2, like verse 11, says, don't forget that you Gentiles used to be outsiders. He's talking about the divide that there was between the Jews and the Gentiles. He says, in those days you were living apart from Christ. He's talking to the Gentiles in Ephesus. He, he said, you were excluded from citizenship among the people of Israel. You did not know the covenant promises God had made to them. He's kind of retelling the history, kind of like what I had said before. And then later on in verse 14 and 16, he says, for Christ has brought peace to us. He united Jews and Gentiles into one people when, in his own body on the cross, he broke down the wall of hostility that separated us. He did this by ending the system of law with its commandments and regulations. He made peace between Jews and Gentiles by creating in himself one new people from the two groups. And together, as one body, Christ reconciled both groups to God by means of his death on the cross, and our hostility toward each other was put to death. So Paul is kind of just bringing up this stuff about how now Jews and Gentiles are all children of God. He says, now you Gentiles are no longer strangers and foreigners. You are citizens with all of God's holy people. You are members of God's family. Together we are his house, built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets. It sounds a little bit similar to the story of the Sneetches, right? By the time Paul is writing this letter to the Ephesians, Jesus is no longer physically present on earth. This takes place long after Jesus has gone back into heaven. This new church that formed is growing with both Jews and Gentiles, but some of the Jews still consider themselves superior to the Gentiles. I think this is part of the reason why Paul wrote this letter. But I also think there's more to this passage than Paul just addressing the inequality that he sees. Paul is trying to set the background for what he calls the mystery of the gospel. 
Let's pick up in today's passage in Ephesians 3 and look at what Paul is calling this mystery. We'll start in Ephesians chapter 3 from verse 1 down to 13. It says, For this reason I, Paul, a prisoner of Christ Jesus on behalf of you Gentiles, assuming that you have heard of the stewardship of God's grace that was given to me for you, how the mystery was made known to me by revelation, as I have written briefly. When you read this, you can perceive my insight into the mystery of Christ, which was not made known to the sons of men in other generations, as it has, been now, as it has now been revealed to his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. This mystery is that the Gentiles are fellow heirs, members of the same body, and partakers of the promise in Christ Jesus through the gospel. Of this gospel I was made a minister according to the gift of God's grace, which was given me by the working of his power. To me, though I am the very least of all the saints, this grace was given to preach to the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ and to bring to light for everyone what is the plan of the mystery hidden for ages in God who created all things so that through the church the manifold wisdom of God might now be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly places. This was according to the eternal purpose that he has realized in Christ Jesus our Lord, in whom we have boldness and access with confidence through our faith in him. So I ask you not to lose heart over what I am suffering for you, which is your glory. I think there are, are two parts of this mystery of the gospel that Paul is writing about. And I think the first part sets the table for the second part. I think that Paul explains how Jesus changed everything in the first couple chapters of Ephesians. How the Gentiles are no longer strangers or excluded. How the Gentiles should not feel inferior to the Jews. And Paul is not the only person to address this issue of inequality between the Jews and the Gentiles. I think Jesus also addressed it in Matthew 20, verses 1 to 15, the parable of the vineyard workers. And it goes like this, For the kingdom of heaven is like the landowner who went out early one morning to hire workers for the vineyard. He agreed to pay the normal daily wage and sent them out to work. At nine o'clock in the morning, he was passing through the marketplace and saw people standing around doing nothing. So he hired them, telling he would pay them whatever was right at the end of the day. So they went to work in the vineyard too. At noon and again at three o'clock, he did the same thing. And at five o'clock that afternoon, he was in town again and saw more people standing around. He asked them, why haven't you been working today? And they replied, well, because no one hired us. The landowner told them, then go out and join the others in my vineyard. That evening, he told the foreman to call the workers in and pay them, beginning with the last workers first. When those hired at five o'clock were paid, each received a full day's wage. When those hired first came to get their pay, they assumed they would receive more, but they too were paid a day's wage. When they received their pay, they protested to the owner. Those people worked only one hour, and yet you paid them just as much as you paid us, who worked all day in the scorching heat. He answered them. He answered one of them, friend, I haven't been unfair. Didn't you agree to work all day for the usual wage? Take your money and go. I wanted to pay this last worker the same as you. Is it against the law for me to do what I want with my money? Should you be jealous because I am kind to others? So those who are now, who are last, now will be first then, and those who are first will be last. The Jews had been working at obeying God's law for a long time, hundreds, thousands of years. And now the Gentiles were coming into the game at this point, and not only were, going, were they going to be part of God's chosen people, but they were going to be considered equal. They were going to receive the same reward as the Jews. God also re revealed this message of inclusion to Peter in Acts chapters 10 and 11. And we're not going to read the whole passage, but in this account, Peter has a vision where God lowers a sheet with a whole variety of animals down before him. And the animals that were on the sheet were considered unclean by the Jews. And to eat one of those animals would, to break, would break the Old Testament law. Yet God tells Peter 
to kill and eat some of these unclean animals. But Peter refuses, saying, I have never eaten anything that is unclean. And then God says, do not call something unclean if God has made it clean. And this is an example of how God and Jesus changed everything. God is making a new covenant with his followers. God's original covenant was with the Jews only. There were things that were clean, they were unclean, and to eat or touch something that was unclean was a sin. But now Gentiles are welcome too. There is no clean or unclean. And God uses Peter, people like Peter and Paul to teach others about this new covenant. He used the vision with Peter in Ephes and in Ephesians 3, Paul writes that he received a revelation from God regarding this mystery. So people have distinct roles in here. Jesus, his role is to play the savior. But God uses humans like Peter and Paul, people like us to spread important messages like this one. God revealed that vision to Peter and he gave a revelation to Paul and then those people took that message to the people around them. And so while I think that part of the mystery of the gospel that Paul is talking about is about Jews now being equals with the, the Jews and the Gentiles being equal, I think there's another part to it too. And I think the second part is more of, of like the why. What purpose does God have for bringing the Jews and the Gentiles together as one body? And I mean, it's a, it's a nice story of bringing everyone together, but is there a greater purpose for that? And I think so. I think in verses 9 and 10 of Ephesians 3 say, to bring light for everyone what is the plan of the mystery hidden for ages in God who created all things, so that the church, the manifold wisdom of God, might now be made known to the rulers and authorities in heavenly places. God wants to bring the Jews and the Gentiles together to make a new body of believers to bring the message of the gospel to everyone. God wants to work through them so that the church brings the manifold wisdom of God to be made known to everyone everywhere. God isn't bringing them together just to sit there and, and, and sing Kumbaya. He wants to use them for a greater purpose. And that purpose is to continue spreading the gospel. To spread the news that people are no longer saved by following the Old Testament law. We are now saved by grace through faith in Jesus. There's a verse in Galatians chapter 2 verse 16. I'm just going to read it to you. It says, Yet we know that a person is made right with God by faith in Jesus Christ, not by obeying the law. And we have believed in Christ Jesus so that we might be made right with God because of our faith in Christ, not because we have obeyed the law. For no one will ever be made right with God by obeying the law. This is the new covenant that God made for us and for the people of that time. <clears throat> I think the three main points to take away from this passage, the first one is that, was in the verse that I just read, that we are not saved by following the law or by doing good things. We're saved by grace through faith in Jesus. God doesn't keep track of our good deeds and balance them out against our sins and then decide if the good outweighs the bad. Romans 8 verses 3 and 4 says the law of Moses was unable to save us because of the weakness of our sinful nature. So God did what the law could not do. He sent his own son in a body like the bodies we sinners have and that body God declared an end to sin's control over us by giving his son as a sacrifice for our sins. He did this so that the just requirement of the law would be fully satisfied for us, who no longer follow our sinful nature, but instead follow the Spirit. It's easy for us to say, well, why didn't God just send Jesus right away? It seems like God could have saved everyone a lot of headaches by not introducing the law in the first place. And the only thing I can say is that, well, God's plans are, are always better than ours. And God had a reason for establishing the law and then sending Jesus later. And it's not really our place to question God's motives with this. In the end, though, salvation comes for everyone. And in the end, we have a pathway to God. <clears throat> I think another thing to, to, to consider about this passage 
is that just like the Gentiles in the, the time of the early church, we too are now a part of this new covenant between God and the body of believers. The covenant that God made 2,000 years ago is still valid today. Jesus came and offered salvation based on grace and not the law. If we accept God's gift of grace, we too become adopted children. We also have the ability to come boldly and confidently into God's presence. In the Old Testament, Gentiles were kept at a distance from the holy parts of the Jewish temple. There was a part of the temple where God's presence dwelled. And once a year, just one day out of the year, on the Day of Atonement, which was one of the Jewish holidays, the high priest was allowed to enter the holiest place of the temple. And it was kind of closed in by a curtain or a veil. And not even the average Jew could go in there. You had to be the high priest in just one day out of the year. When Jesus died on the cross, the Bible says that that temple curtain was torn in two, which opened up God's presence to everyone. Which means that today through prayer, we are able to bring our request before God and not just a priest. It doesn't matter if you are Jew or Gentile, we all have access to God. We are a part of this new covenant too. We all now have stars on our bellies. I think the last important thing to consider is that God intends his salvation to reach the ends of the earth. Ephesians 3.10 says, God's purpose in all this was to use the church to display his wisdom in its rich variety to all the unseen rulers in authorities and the heavenly places. I think what this means is that God plans to use us, meaning the worldwide body of believers, to spread the good news of Jesus to every part of the earth. And I think that should make us feel important, but it should also challenge us. We are part of God's chosen people now, but we're not called to sit around and just bask in that title. I think God expects us to work in his vineyard, to spread the word of the saving grace of the gospel. I think it's remarkable that God would give us a role like that, like to you and to me. We have a part in this mystery of the gospel. We didn't get to play the role of savior, and we weren't given a vision or a revelation like Peter and Paul, but we have a job to do now. We have a role. And that role is to take the message to the ends of the earth. To explain this mystery of the gospel to others. To invite them into the body of believers. Let's pray.